All right, so hello everyone. Uh, another session of our CNCF uh, research and user group. Uh, today we'll have one main topic, which is an update on the developments on upstream Kubernetes in the area of jobs and job set. And we have Kevin to give us the update. So thanks a lot, Kevin. And um, yeah, go ahead. Of course, yes. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about the updates on what the Kubernetes community has been doing in the, the job API. And I'm also going to introduce a project called Jobset. Uh, I actually started my career as a Kubernetes engineer trying to support uh, researchers running scientific workflows on both Slurm and Kubernetes. And I kind of saw there were a lot of gaps in the Kubernetes space around batch scheduling. And I've been kind of trying to improve that ever since. Uh, I currently work as a senior software engineer at Red Hat, uh, focused mostly on Kubernetes upstream. And so I spend a lot of time looking at all this. Uh, so kind of to start off with, what I like to kind of go through is what actually happens when a pod, like what, what's actually going on when a pod is created. Uh, at the end of the day, like a user or a workload is gonna create a pod and then that goes to the API server and then uh, gets stored in etcd and then the scheduler, which is a uh, cube scheduler and Kubernetes will actually be trying to find a node that satisfies the pod requests. Uh, what I've seen from the usage in the HPC community is that typically the scheduler is very different from like stuff like, uh, like Slurm or Yarn because it kind of has a much limited scope, I would say. It's really for, it's doing node level scheduling. And so that's like one area that's kind of different. And then effectively a lot of the, the bindings of the CPU and all that kind of stuff is done in Kubelet. Uh, and that's, Kubelet is a node agent that actually runs uh, the container that communicates with the container runtime, such as cryo or container RD to actually start your pod or you start your images, all that. and so why I brought this up is because I think this is important to have in your a mental model for like what actually happens when you create a pod. This is, I, I call this like, this, it's kind of like a scheduling or it's like the pod life cycle loop. And effectively it's sort of like a racehorse. Like as soon as you create a pod, you are, you're hitting this loop. And if you have too many pods, uh, you can actually cause some problems in your cluster. So, Generally, when you're building a batch platform or really like Kubernetes 101 is really all about like you, you should use some kind of workload to manage pods. So for, for microservices, really Kubernetes tries to encourage people to use deployments or stateful sets if you need state. Uh, and that's, and those, that's designed to keep your pods running forever. Uh, and then you, and so why is that useful? Because you kind of get self-healing in your workloads. So if a node goes down and your pod is failing, it will actually recreate and start the scheduling loop all over again and find a new node for you. And it keeps your microservices up and running. Uh, and now I think that honestly, what I have seen over the years are batch users want the same kind of behavior for running workloads. Like if a node fails, they want to relocate to a different node so that they can continue their jobs running. Now it's a bit harder to support in the batch case because you got a lot of state and some of these calculations are using expensive devices. So you might have to handle things a little bit differently, but generally there's not much difference between a batch user and a microservices in the sense that they want self-healing. The last thing is generally the pod API is, a, is a, an atomic component in Kubernetes. It's used everywhere for all kinds of workloads and trying to add API, API changes into the pod API to benefit the batch user doesn't really go over that well uh, because you would need to think of all the cases around microservices and all that and make sure that your use case fits both. So typically I, what I've, I don't really encourage people to try and propose new APIs in the pod API for the batch use case. And the last one that is super important for a batch user is queuing. This kind of helps mitigate the thundering herd issue on clusters where 
if you have too many pods getting created, you're draining your cluster because you have that scheduling loop continuously going on and on and on. And you can actually either, in, you know, best case, after a while, you might slow down your cluster. So the API server might take a little bit longer, but you can actually also lock, potentially lock up at CD. And then you can actually uh, have to take some manual efforts to get your cluster back in a functional state. So typically this is a major problem when you're having way more pods than you have capacity on your cluster. So you have a lot of pods kind of getting stuck in a scheduling loop. So this is the reason why there are a lot of open source. Uh, some of these are CNCF projects, others are uh, projects as part of Apache and others are other, some are separate open source projects entirely. But this is why there's so many of these projects. Like I have listed a few of them. I'm sure, I think there are actually more now. Every year it seems I hear a new one being created. But generally, Volcano is kind of one of the first ones to the. It's one of the first projects I know of for running batch, uh, sys, uh, doing batch jobs on top of Kubernetes. They kind of have their own queuing and scheduling, and it's a really full fledged platform for running batch jobs. Armada was a project for running, is a project for running pods across multiple Kubernetes clusters. It kind of tries to replicate the idea of HT Condor. Uh, and Kubeflow, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about Kubeflow in the, throughout this talk, but generally Kubeflow is a collection of controllers trying to help machine learning people run uh, those types of, those types of things on Kubernetes. So they have you know, various things like a notebook controller. They also have training and they have stuff like, uh, I forgot, well, they have a lot of things in there for pipe for machine learning pipelines. And they kind of have designated controllers for each of these components. And those are the main ones. So what are you, what's the main problem that you have with all these different APIs? Well, each of them took a, like most of them take a different approach for how to represent a, a job. Uh, Kubeflow kind of has a similar pattern for the most part of they use a pod and a service uh, to represent, and then they have a higher level workload called, like, you know, depending on your machine learning framework of choice, they have a job designated for that. And then uh, all of them kind of have, you know, different approaches. And honestly, it's a little bit, it's pretty chaotic because, you know, it was not clear to me when I first started at this, like, if I want to run a batch job in Kubernetes, like, what should I use? Should I use a Kubernetes job? Should I use a Kubeflow? Should I use Volcano? Do I use Armada? Like, I don't really know. And to be honest, the answer is kind of it's confusing to me. And I think it's confusing to a lot of people because there's a lot of different ways to do this. So to be honest, we're kind of, it was kind of in a chaotic state a few years ago. Cause like, to be honest, the job API was not quite there to support a lot of these use cases. So this is why these projects were created. Uh, and, and over the last few years, there's been a, a working group in the Kubernetes community uh, called, uh, I guess the working group batch is what the title is uh, in the Kubernetes Slack, it's WG hyphen batch. Uh, this is basically, they were designed to kind of reduce the chaos in the ecosystem, if you will. We wanted to kind of say we want to improve the job API in Kubernetes so that people can use that rather than having to use these separate projects to run jobs and then kind of causing a maintenance problem where every group was sort of supporting this in a different way. Uh, and so the top, I'm going to focus on the top two bullet points for the rest of this talk. I'm going to go through kind of what has actually been done in the batch API to make it an easier an easier way to run batch jobs in Kubernetes. And then also talk a little bit about workload or job level queuing through a project called Q. Uh, and some other areas that I think are actually really interesting, but I did not cover in this talk are the last two bullet points, which is, uh, you know, how to control and maximize utilization of resources and on-prem and in uh, cloud clusters. And the other one is runtime and scheduling support. That actually has been splintered off into a separate working group because it is actually a very interesting problem that involves a lot of different people. And, you know, you might see in Kubernetes, there's a, a device management group that's actually kind of leading a lot of this effort for, a, for how to design this in a better way. But if you are curious, you can 
Slack me and I can tell you more about that, but I won't talk about more about that in the rest of this talk. So what is the job API? If you're not familiar, I just want to kind of give a couple components to highlight. Uh, job API, pretty simple. I would say probably the biggest problem in the early stages is it didn't really fit a lot of the HPC use case because there is there was no communication among the pods of the job. Uh, and so, but effectively what the job API is doing is you have this pod template and you have parallelisms, which is kind of similar to replicas. And you have this completions, which is how many of your pods, once they're complete, can I mark my job as a success? So in this case, I have one replica and one completion. That means that if one of my pods succeed, which is all of them, my job should be considered successful, but you can kind of have uh, different ways to specify that. So you could say like, I have, I want a couple of these jobs, pods to succeed. I want my overall job to be successful and that's it. Uh, back off limit is the number of retries. This is kind of how the job, this is how the job API handles self healing. If a pod is running, um, I want a number of retries in case there's network failures or anything. I want to keep retrying up to six times, up to the back off limit specification. And then I'll declare my job as uh, my job has failed and I'll move on. So how do you, uh, what was the next feature for really making this more useful for the HPC user? Uh, this is kind of a, it's a sort of a subtle feature, but we introduced a new uh, field in the job API called an index job. This kind of exposes uh, an environment variable and labels for each of the indexes of your job. So you, if you're using like an MPI like job, maybe your rank zero pod, you want to make sure that you always know uh, if you can always find that pod because he is kind of like your leader and then you have a bunch of workers. That's kind of the idea. And so that's sort of what the one of the goals of the index job was. And then if you couple this with a, a, a headless service, uh, you can actually get communication with all your pods. So all, all your pods are able to talk to one another, and then you're, you can actually run a, uh, you can run more complicated jobs that require communication within the job. So uh, that, that's one feature that was introduced in the batch API. Uh, the next one is one of my favorite features to follow. It seems a, like it's a pretty simple feature, pod failure policy. It, the idea is if I'm a user and uh, I want, like, let's say I'm an admin running, uh, or let's say I'm, a, I'm using a GPU and I'm having a segmentation fault and I have my retries limit way up because I, I want my job to continue self-healing, if you will, and, I, and I'm confident in my code. Well, if you're segmentation faulting, your, your code's probably not that great, it's failing, but you're still using that GPU and you're taking that device away from somebody else. And so one of the ideas was, can we tune the pot, the back off limit? So can we end early if a job is failing for a particular reason? So on the left hand side, I have an example of using exit codes to kind of fail your job early. So if you hit, if you hit an exit code of 42 for this simple dummy example, I can actually, I'll declare my job failed immediately and not retry anymore. Now the counterpoint to this is what we also see is if I'm a if I'm running a batch job on a Kubernetes cluster and let's say my pod gets preempted or my node gets preempted or really I guess it would be a pod getting preempted, I don't really think I should be penalized for uh, for my job failing because I it was failed for a disruption that was not caused by my code. So maybe I can. Uh, ignore the back off limit counter in that case. And that's kind of one idea we had with the pod failure policy is to, we can, we also have ignoring the counts of the limit based off certain conditions. Uh, this actually, this is why it's one of my favorite features because there was a lot of collaboration between the different groups in Kubernetes, which are called SIGs, uh, special interest groups where Basically, how do you how do you determine a disruption, and how do you make sure that the state of your pod is expected? If, like, say, you have an ohm kill, 
or a preempted event or an evicted, I'm oh, sorry, a preempted pod or an evicted pod, we have to make sure they kind of go into the same state to get this feature to work. And there were some bugs there. And over time, we've kind of fixed a lot of these. So that this feature actually went GA as of the last release of Kubernetes in 1.31. And uh, yeah, so it's an interesting one to follow over the years because you can kind of see uh, people working together to try to achieve a pretty relatively simple ask. But as we all know, code is never simple. Uh, and one of the more recent features is a pod success policy. This idea of can I specify uh, certain indexes that are going to succeed. In this case, I would say if my zero, my two or three indexes of my pod complete, then I want to consider my my pod my job successful, and uh, that's pretty much. The idea it's kind of a counterpoint to the pod failure policy where we have one where we want to declare our job successful early uh, and yeah so we think this will be useful and there are there are definitely some use cases we had in mind when we, when we developed this feature uh, one of the last uh, features I'll highlight for the job API this is a relatively subtle feature uh, it's actually a, a boolean in your pod in your job spec called suspend, which uh, by default is false. But this kind of helps mitigate the thundering herd problem of the cluster because what you're doing is you're registering your workload like a job, and you know under the hood we know how many pods a job is going to create. But and so let's say what we kind of want is we want to register our workload with an API server and then have some external controller kind of monitor the cluster and make sure I have capacity for this workload and then resume that workload once I have capacity. This is effectively the high level operation of a project called Q, which I think this group, I uh, heard a talk from them a few months ago or a few weeks ago, maybe now. Uh, but basically the idea is I have workloads that have a suspend field and then I can un, I can resume them if I have capacity on my cluster. And one of my favorite things about following the Q project is they took a very pragmatic approach for integration where they want to try to meet uh, users where they are. Like they're using workloads like Kubeflow, Ray. Uh, I forgot all the ones that are in there. Those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, but all of these workloads are very popular in the Kubernetes space, and we want to have integration with Q, but we don't want to force everybody to use the job API, which, you know, because a lot of people are not really willing to move their APIs over, so we kind of got to meet them where they are. So this is a really interesting project to follow. Uh, they are really trying to push a lot of the, the Kubernetes community to think about queuing, and you'll see a lot of features kind of coming from this project to kind of support this use case and others. So very interesting project to follow. So at, I, I highlighted only a few of the features that the, the batch working group has promoted over the years. Uh, some of these are, uh, are GA'd uh, in most supported versions of Kubernetes. I think the top four, I don't think they, I think they have been GA'd for at least since 1.27. So they, for all the open source supported versions of Kubernetes, they're fully available and ready for use. Uh, the ready pods is one I didn't talk too much about, but this is kind of this idea of tracking, like pods have a state called readiness. And when a pod is ready, it is effectively running in some areas, but it, it can mean that it is, there might be a state where your pod is running, but maybe, you're, maybe it takes a little bit of time to get ready to serve traffic. That's kind of the idea of readiness, and it's, I'll talk about why that's important for a little bit later. Uh, and then pod replacement policy is actually a cap that I, it was my first cap that I got merged in the Kubernetes ecosystem. This one was just about when, a, when a, an underlying pod of a job gets terminated, we were creating a replacement immediately, and this kind of causes some problems in machine learning frameworks because you might have two pods that are having the same index and they kind of fight over one another and then you get some uh, framework errors that appear. So the idea was to halt the creation. 
halt the creation of a replacement pod until the until the original pod is fully terminated. Uh, and so that's it for the Java API. Uh, I think one thing that's really interesting to see, and uh, for this group, I wanted to give a, I wanted to come here because I was thinking, like, as an end user, if you're using a lot of these like projects and frameworks, we are seeing a lot of people really be willing to integrate with stuff like Q or the Java API. You know, for example, if you're a Dask user, I actually posted this issue a few maybe a year or two now ago, like trying to maybe build an integration with the Dask operator to kind of start saying like, you know, if you have the suspend field in Dask, you can actually build an integration with Q and you can actually have queuing with something like Dask, which I thought would be pretty cool. But anyway, some of these uh, projects have really kind of picked up like seeing the benefits. Uh, Airflow, it's a popular workflow engine and they used to only support pods. Uh, so when you had, Airflow running on Kubernetes, you could create a pod on your Kubernetes cluster. Well, sometimes uh, that, you know, I already mentioned that can cause some problems and uh, it's hard to represent a more complicated job that way. So somebody actually added a new operator in Airflow called the Kubernetes job operator to kind of follow a lot of the benefits of this. So I think that's super cool. Probably a more challenging aspect of keeping up with the job API is actually coming from the Kubeflow community. They're getting a lot of feature requests for stuff like pod failure policy and other job features that that community, that the Kubernetes community has been creating. But, you know, as all most open source projects are, it's difficult to keep up with all the features that are coming in. And Kubeflow is kind of hitting a point where some of these features are actually really difficult to support over time because of their their choice of what they use for their framework. So using pods and services, they kind of would have to implement a counter a counter API to all these features to support it and kind of re-implement everything in that area. And there's you know some challenges with that. So what uh, last thing this or another thing this batch group has kind of started looking at is trying to understand how like what are the requirements for a distributed job? And in my, you know, a lot of the focus is in machine learning nowadays. I always like to try to keep in mind the, the high performance computing user and also researchers running, you know, maybe not machine learning training, but maybe some other kind of job where they kind of have a very, they all have very similar requirements. So what we wanted to kind of do is start thinking about, you know, what's the common component among all these batch, batch projects and maybe design like a stable API that people could build off of. So at the end of the day, we have five, we had five requirements really for a distributed job, uh, multiple templates. This is this idea of so probably a major limitation of the job API is that you can only have a single pod template and you can say how many replicas of that pod template you have. That's fine for a lot of cases, but for a distributed job, like say you have an MPI job with a leader, uh, a leader pod and workers where they have, they're using a different container or they're using different environment variables or different commands or arguments, you kind of can't really represent that with a distributed job. And so Volcano and Kubeflow kind of immediately jumped at that and created these own representation for this to really solve this problem. So that was one of the top ones we wanted to solve. Uh, failure and success policies are, you know, kind of this idea of if I have leaders and workers, or I have, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. If I have a single template that I know, if it fails, I want my entire job to be failed. Counterpoint is if I have a separate template where all of them succeed, I want to mark my job as a successful. And uh, startup policy is another one where we might want. We want our leader to kind of start and start being up and ready to serve traffic, if you will. And then your workers can start and communicate with the leader. But if you wait, if you if your workers and leaders are created at the same time, you're going to hit a bunch of failures. So you kind of want to halt some execution until things are ready to go. And then the last thing is communication between all these pods. You know, an embarrassingly parallel workload doesn't need any communication. Well, a distributed job would actually, you probably would want some kind of communication with all your pods because 
you are trying to represent it as a single job for that reason. So this is uh, the batch working group proposed a, a Kubernetes SIG project called job set. Uh, this is this idea of having templates for trying to have trying to use uh, a Kubernetes job and then you can represent these jobs in uh, using te different templates and at the end of the day uh, we have support you know conveni conveniently we have support for what we call a distributed job we have features for failure policies success policies startup policies and we also create a headless service under the hood so that all these workloads can communicate to one another and then also uh, i like to view q as kind of uh, q and job set are sort of two peas in a pod we're always working together with the q community to uh, make sure that job set is supported for most of the features because you know we have job and job set are two major areas we want to try to propel in the kubernetes community uh, and we work closely with them. Uh, so at a high level, the, the job set API is pretty simple. So we are kind of using, uh, we have this idea of a replicated job and then we have a job template. And then this is kind of your job spec. Uh, and you have, in this case, I'm representing, I'm running, this is how you could actually represent a PyTorch job using job set. So I have, uh, I have a head, under the hood, a headless service is getting created for this job. And with that, I'm able to actually have my, my master is the zeroth index of my pod, or sorry, the zeroth index of, of a pod. And I'm able to specify uh, the right environment variable to communicate with him via the master. And then I'm able to run a torch run with four pod replicas. And this actually, uh, like if you try to represent this with a job, it would not work out of the box because you would need the headless service also created. Uh, and so that's kind of one of our first major use cases was can we represent some of these uh, machine learning workflows pretty easily using a job set and have all these kind of job features that we wanted. So uh, the next one is success policies. Uh, this is uh, a major area that we wanted to target was like, let's say if my workers, you know, if my workers succeed, I want to mark my overall job set as a success. And that's kind of what you can do with the success policy. So workers complete, my leader will get teared down and I can move on and, and have my job set be marked as successful. And that helps uh, and that, that satisfies a lot of the use cases we had from users, from people about why they use stuff like Volcano and other projects was a lot of times for some of this, this usefulness for these, some of these APIs. Uh, startup policy is another simple one. This is, I already mentioned this, but the idea is that uh, I can have my driver start first, or sorry, this will start it in order as listed on your jobs, on your job set spec. So in this case, it will say I have my driver and then once it passes the readiness probes, it's considered ready. And then my workers will go ahead and start. Uh, and uh, by default, if you don't have a startup policy, we kind of would just create the driver and the workers. And depending on where the nodes, where, where your your jobs went, it would you could have your workers start first while your driver is still getting scheduled. And so that's kind of why we wanted to sort of have the startup policy work in its way because we 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 want to kind of control the creation of these and make sure they're ready before the next one on the list goes. Of uh, the last or one feature that just recently was released in the job set as of a few weeks ago, or job set had a failure policy in the beginning where they had kind of the max restarts. This is kind of like the equivalent of a back off limit in the job API. And it sort of says, you know, if I job, if one of my jobs fails, I want to go ahead and restart the entire job set. Uh, and then we can have a, a max limit of three. Well, what do we do if a, a job is failing for particular reasons? Like, you know, maybe uh, we have a pod failure policy that we, we, we want to tolerate. And so we kind of want to keep restarting in that case, it's kind of on the left hand side, that is uh, effectively one way to do this. And this is actually, uh, 
reusing a lot of the features in the job API, like the pod failure policy, when it actually fails, it sets a, a condition in Kubernetes and, and a particular reason will kind of tell you why your job failed. You know, in this case, it would say pod failure policy. And then uh, you could kind of say if my leader failed for a certain reason due to a pod failure policy, maybe I just want to fail my job set. Maybe I just want to restart. It's kind of building these robust rules into your workloads. Uh, and then you also have the counterpoint where if my leader fails, maybe I just want to fail outright uh, and I don't and and I want to continue on or I want my job set to be marked as failed and kind of move on. Uh, and that's kind of the idea with the failure policy. Uh, and so the last thing I wanted to kind of, this is probably the most exciting thing to me was uh, in the last few weeks, really, maybe, or no, maybe it was a few months ago, the Kubeflow community has kind of been looking at how to design the next uh, version of their training operator. Uh, one and this is all in the design phase. They have they have drafted a Kubeflow kep, kind of walking through this, and I I'll just explain it kind of briefly. But generally, the idea is Kubeflow was designed to help improve the machine learning lifecycle in Kubernetes. And what they find is a lot of data scientists and machine learning practitioners don't really want to know too much about Kubernetes. Like that's kind of that should be delegated to the role of a platform engineer. They are kind of the ones setting up the the Kubernetes cluster. They're setting up how you want to run certain jobs in Kubernetes. And then maybe a data scientist kind of wants to inject, you know, their images or the containers or tune their pod spec for their workload but they don't want to have to know about how do I run a, a PyTorch job on Kubernetes? Like maybe I just want to reuse the same template that everyone else has been using for running a PyTorch job on Kubernetes. So at the end of the day, why I'm bringing this project up is because at the, you know, the top there, you can see job set. Uh, the idea was, can we get a lot of the features that the job uh, project has been adding and we can and we could also have the multiple template aspect that Kubeflow actually uses. And we can use a job set to represent that for training. And then we can kind of uh, sort of gravitate towards the API that our user, that the users want for Kubeflow and also maybe help try to push more of the, the maintenance of these features into, on the job set. And that way the Kubeflow community can focus more on the machine learning use case. On the bottom right here, I have a QR code. If you're interested to read more, it's a very well detailed enhancement about how they want the Kubeflow project to go going forward. Uh, so generally, uh, I always like to end my talks. I'm giving open source talks about like, you know, we want people to try these features. Just like they're really our goal is that people try them, post issues on GitHub or message people or message the the working group batch on Kubernetes Slack about what you tried and what didn't work. Uh, I know that one of my, I actually started my career in Kubernetes by working with the batch working group and I found them to be incredibly helpful for uh, answering questions around features and bug reports and how to, how to actually design like some kind of batch platform on Kubernetes, like what's the best practices for that. They've been really helpful and in generally uh, all these projects like job, job set, and queue are all really open for new features and trying to steer how you can actually get these implemented in Kubernetes. Uh, so the last part of my talk, I wanted to kind of give a live demo of job set. So uh, I was going to go just to make sure. Can you all see uh, my terminal? Not really. We just see your uh, slides. Mm -hmm. You're right. Because that's All right, can you see a terminal now? Yep, yep, okay. very good. All right, great. All right, I'm just gonna quickly go to the job set website. I'll just show, to make it simple, I wanna show how you can install this on a simple kind cluster, just to kind of show like how you could test this out. So uh, we just recently released our version 0 0.6, whatever, 0 0.6. So I can paste this. 
uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm, I'm installing a cube, this is a cube builder operator. Uh, generally, you want to wait until the, uh, the controller is created because uh, there's some web hooks that will, you will fail if they aren't uh, there. So you kind of just usually wait until this is done. All right, looks like it's good now. So it's running. Uh, so now I have some simple examples. I will show startup policy first. So this looks very similar to my, my YAML that I showed earlier. Uh, let's go ahead and create it and we can walk through what it does. So uh, I have, I've created this job set called startup driver ready. It actually is creating jobs under the hood. And again, this is startup policy. So it's running the driver first and waiting for the readiness. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that we don't show this in the table, but you can see that the job status is saying that it's not ready yet. So that's why it's, it's not creating the other objects here. It should, should happen soon. Uh, uh, but basically, uh, I guess, yeah, it should happen soon. Let's see. Almost. Uh, interesting. Oh, uh, wait. <laughs> now it is running. Okay, that's why I said four. So now you can see the driver is running, the workers are running, uh, and, you know, uh, well, there's nothing. It hasn't finished yet, so that's at least what's going on there. So that's the startup policy. Uh, oh, and the last thing, as I mentioned, headless services. You can see here the startup driver ready. This thing is just created on every job, on every job set. Uh, it's a pretty simple service that kind of allows you to, allows the communication. Uh, and uh, I will go to a nice simple one just to show uh, what I want to show. I'll show the uh, success policy. So uh, this is basically uh, kind of showing I have, uh, uh, this has a leader who's sleeping for a really long time and I have workers and they're gonna sleep uh, very shortly. So you can see here, my workers have completed. My job set is actually my leaders are being terminated. So then I can go here and I can actually say, okay, my job set is actually completed. Uh, the terminal state just kind of represents phase. I don't know why we have a completed true here, but whatever. Uh, the terminal state is actually an interesting story because uh, Argo, uh, the community for Argo workflows was looking at uh, trying to use job set, or I think it was actually Metaflow from Netflix was trying to use job set and they find that they wanted to use it with Argo workflows and they were wanted to use a phase to kind of determine whether or not their job set was successful or not. So we actually introduced a feature called terminal state that kind of allows uh, easier integration uh, with Argo. So I'll just show that. I don't know if I have that one. Uh, so that's at least success policy. And then I will go ahead and do max restarts. So this is kind of, uh, shows restarts three times. And I'll wait for that one. That won't take a little bit. And then the last, uh, feature I want to show was failure policy. Uh, Let's see what this one. Yeah, so I'll show this one. So uh, you can see here I have some leaders. So this would say if it exits one, you can see here what happened is I actually have a pod failure policy. We have this, what we would call a uh, 
it's a reason is pod failure policy and you can see here in the condition it says why it failed and then this is actually what the job set is able to uh Uh, that's why the job set will actually, uh, it will show like how much, uh, it will actually predict why it failed for a certain reason based off bubbling up that information. Uh, and yeah, so that is, that's kind of all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and so I'm open for questions now. I might have stopped sharing. All right, <clears throat> that was awesome. Thanks a lot for all the updates. Um, I see that Clemens dropped out. I see Timothy, Sylvia, do you have questions? Oh, uh, there is one from Clemens. He asked, uh, do you see projects like Volcano, Kubeflow adapting the new job schemas such as job set? Uh, Kubeflow. Uh, is the one where we are seeing uh, features from them. As yeah, yeah, I saw I saw that they already have integration with things like Q as well. So it's something we want to to try as well in, in our deployments. Any questions from Tim or Sylvia? <clears throat> Otherwise, um, I, I did have a question because you were mentioning Dask, and uh, actually Dask is uh, is one of those that is quite popular in our community, and we do use like the Kubernetes operation operator uh, Kubernetes backend in addition to others with Dask. Um, you, you mentioned like supporting uh, jobs in Dask, how would that actually work? Because my, my understanding is that what Dask is doing is deploying workers in a Kubernetes cluster and then pulling from like a central pool for, for different tasks. Well, yeah, I guess I wasn't going to say they have to support jobs, but if they could implement something like a suspend uh, semantics in Dask, uh, that could make integration with Q possible. Now, I created that issue before Q had integration with uh, pods through via the use of scheduling gates. So uh, it becomes less like what we're seeing is like the 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 first class citizen in Q would be supporting like a suspend semantics, but in a lot of cases, a lot of people are still using uh, uh, pods uh, directly. And pods can't really do a suspend in the way to kind of have that is done via the use of scheduling gates, where you kind of pause the scheduling loop effectively for a pod. And so that could be one option. That's actually what we have. we're seeing. Projects like Argo, like Argo workflows, can have a rough integration with Q via the use of scheduling gates, uh, and and also uh, Q does support uh, pod integration that way but yeah so that's kind of the idea what is like kubeflow when they want to get support for q they actually created the suspend field and then kind of worked through a lot of the implementation of that and then someone on the q side built uh, integration you know, for a q controller there and then that's sort of how the, the integration went for dask the idea could be you know implementing suspend which is really just about my field is set. I want to halt. I don't want the those objects to be created. Once it's unset, I'll create those objects, and then if that field is set again, I'll probably delete those objects. It's kind of that's at least the the flow we implemented in job set, and in Kubeflow, it's a very similar idea. Yep, sounds good. Well, it's something we can also have a look at because with the pod, like you said, with the pod integration in Q, we can probably already look at this. Uh, so uh, I guess one question I have, like, what kind of workloads are you all using in 
your Kubernetes environments. Yep. Good. I'll let uh, Sylvia go oh. first. Yes, so we are just starting to, uh, sorry, put my head. Uh, we are just starting to build an AI service. So at the moment, we have uh, licenses from HP for machine learning uh, development environment. So we are starting with this but we just have it for 64 GPUs. So we'll need to look at other solution to add more users and scale uh, later. So you, uh, so MLD does uh, uh, GPU management. We can do across uh, Kubernetes cluster. It has also multi-tenancy. Uh, we, we are just a process on working with them and trying to uh, have it work on our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So I'm interested on the new tools, the open source tool, because we uh, we are a university. So uh, <laughs> licenses are quite expensive. And so I'm looking at uh, uh, um, other solution, Kubeflow. And this can be integrated with Kubeflow could be great. Um, so yes, that's the kind of things that I'm looking at. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> No, it does. Yeah, no, that's that's helpful. Yeah, it's. I find every every person I talk to has a. They use different tools. That's what made it. Uh, it makes it difficult to really understand like what's the best approach because everybody everyone uses something different. I think Ricardo. I think you and I talked briefly. I think you were exploring Kubeflow, at CERN for a little while, or. No, we, we are running a managed service with Kubeflow for, for AIML. We're actually expanding it. Um, and what we have been trying to, to do is also look at Q uh, to, and integrating with Q uh, for other workloads as well. Um, so is like, it um, a managed service as in like a cloud vendor managed or you're managing no, it? No, um, yeah, yeah, we offer it uh, to our users, yeah. But uh, the, the main thing we've been trying is to, to integrate uh, interactive with batch workloads uh, in the same cluster, and especially for GPUs to make the best of them, because we, well, like many people, we, we tend to part or to split the assignment of GPUs between services, and what we end up is uh, quite a lot of inefficiency in the more interactive working hours kind of uh, usage of GPUs in one set. And then uh, we can't basically backfill those with uh, with jobs during the night easily. So yeah. or during the day. So we are, we are looking at this to have a single deployment where we can put both worlds. Sorry, it's all a cat jump in the background. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one uh, thing I've always wondered with uh, interactive notebooks. Have you, do you have support for like multiple nodes with Jupyter? Like like spawning a job that has like, yeah. No, That's it's, you can you can have multiple GPUs in a single node, but you won't have multiple nodes. Yeah. Yeah, because that's something I've actually, there's, in the Kubernetes community, they've, we've had a lot of working groups now, probably too many if you ask me, but anyway, we have batch, then we have serving, and then device management. And I've always been curious about like if serving should really incorporate a lot of the use cases from notebooks, because at the end of the day, serving and inferencing and notebooks, I think are a very similar use, user pattern. Uh, but I haven't really found like a great uh, example for notebooks on Kubernetes. Like, I don't know if that's Kubeflow notebooks is pretty no, there's what? like Jupyter Hub is probably the most popular one uh, to the Sorry, Jupyter Hub. Yeah, that and, runs on Kubernetes. I've used it before, but I didn't know. Yeah, and there's even a, there's a hum chart called Zero to Jupyter Hub, which is extremely popular. Uh, like a lot of the members in this group will be using it, and it's extremely popular. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, usually the pattern will be that people have a single notebook or a couple of them and notebooks are single node, but then what they do is they 
put some magic in the notebook uh, systems or in the as extensions to Jupyter Lab or something similar so that you can submit from your notebook to some sort of like batch system behind. This can be anything. This Lorem HD Condor task. So the task integration with notebooks is very good. And uh, Kubeflow used to have a component called Kale that was abandoned and now is being donated again to Kubeflow. So there's some I remember that. Yeah, I think that was Arico or A R R I K O. I think they offered yeah, some Arico. Yeah, yeah. support for that. Uh, oh, oh, that's. I had one more question as we have two more minutes. Uh, one, one thing that it always comes to us is the multi cluster. Uh, so um, we are looking at multi queue, um, and there are some. We, we, yeah, there, there's some things to work out there, like uh, a lot of the tools we use, like Kubeflow, Argo, and others, they use the Kubernetes API to get things like logs, for example. And uh, in the multi-cluster, these things are not supported or not yet supported. Let's put it like this. If we start looking at things like job sets, um, I guess this, if we look at multi-cluster and job sets, this could have an impact. Uh, how is the coordination between, would there be like a one cluster, you would be submitting the job sets to a multi-queue instance that then distributes this in different clusters or how would this work? Uh, I don't know if it would span multiple clusters. Uh, I haven't actually thought about how that would work. Uh, I would think that multi-queue from what I remember, it kind of is when you create an object, you're sort of picking which cluster it goes to and I think that we would say like job set goes on one cluster and then logs, I guess you'd have to know like what cluster mm -hmm. your job set was on. So then you could grab the logs of those pods. Uh, yeah, I think, I think they're implementing this on multi-queue. That was my understanding. And the support for jobs in multi-queue is pretty good. They don't support pods yet, but they were working on it as well. Uh, but I was just thinking when we had job sets, uh, I guess there's an implication there. If we collocate always in the same cluster, I think it's, in my head at least, it's kind of more obvious, but I was thinking if it starts splitting. How yeah, I don't, I don't know ex exactly how controllers work across clusters. Like I, I know that there, the multi-cluster community in Kubernetes has been doing a lot of work, but I'm never really sure like where. I remember seeing a, project called multi-cluster controller where it was kind of build like general controllers for multi-cluster but i don't know where that went or <laughs> how far that got along i'm not as much in the multi-cluster space anymore okay so um maybe i'll i'll, I'll open a, an issue we do, uh, multi queue from one it, at least uh i think job set was one that we have explicit support for okay uh they do try to we do follow exactly kind of what they're doing and what we're doing and try to co coordinate. So we have a uh, managed by is a support field for it, which tells you which controller is actually running uh, the object and that that isn't supported in job set that I haven't, I haven't played around with multi queue that much. Sounds very good. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I think we're on time then. We're on the hour. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you uh, for letting me come here and give a talk. Yeah, thank you for presenting. And what I will do is also share the recording on the channel. And um, I think we can ask for for more feedback and uh, for people to go towards you if they have more uh, feedback. I just, yeah, and uh, I already shared the, the slides on the Slack as part of the meeting invite. I don't know how you, like, you feel free to upload them. Yeah. Uh, I have a public share link for that, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah, if you send me, I'll, I'll, I'll update the, the agenda also with the link. Okay. Yeah, thanks I so much. Sure. I'm sure we'll, we'll stay in touch uh, in the next couple of months for sure, and we'll ask you to come back at some point. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.